Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Salvation is an important theme throughout the Bible. We see that there is a relationship between salvation and the manifestation of God's glory. God, because he wants his glory to be manifested, and ultimately there's a very important verse from the book of Isaiah that says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole world, and this means all of creation, will be full of his glory. And that phrase speaks about the kingdom of God having been established. And the establishment of the kingdom of God is related to salvation. So God desires to save. He wants his glory seen because when God's glory is manifested, it is because good things are taking place. God's will is being done. And we look in the scripture and we see that the king, the king who trusts in God, relies upon him, moves in regard to the instructions of God. This king will be an instrument that manifests God's glory because this king will be successful in bringing about the salvation, that is, the victory of God. And what is the victory of God? His will being realized, His will taking place. Now, in the psalm that we're going to look at, and you can open up your Bibles and look with me to Psalm 21, this 21st psalm focuses in on the king, how he responds, and because of his obedience, because of his reliance upon God, because of all of this, salvation is manifested. We're going to see a description of victory. And through all of that, the glory of God is seen. And that's what we should desire in our own life. Now, the king, when we look at what the Bible says about the king of Israel, he is required to write for himself a copy of God's instruction, the Torah. He needs to know God's commandments, what God expects. The king, yes, he is the ruler, but he is called to be the example. He leads the people. And a king who demonstrates reliance, trust, faith in God, he will lead the people to experience God's victory. Salvation, the glory of God, will be manifested throughout his domain. That's what a godly king does. And this is exactly what David writes about in this psalm, Psalm 21. Let's begin. Verse 1. And again, we have that short inscription. Lam natzech mizmor le David. To the leader, the choir director, the chief musician a psalm of David. Now that's what verse 1 says in the Hebrew text. In your Bible, that first verse continues. It's verse 2 in the Hebrew, and it says here, Lord, in your strength, the king will be glad. Now notice there's a relationship between God's strength and the implication is being manifested. The king utilizes the strength of God. And where is God's strength available to us? In his will. When we are carrying out his work. It is in the midst of obedience that we have access to 
the resources, the provision of God. And when we're in his will, utilizing his provision, the outcome is going to be, and this is what this scripture says, gladness. And it continues in a parallel manner. Remember Hebrew poetry, parallelism. We see that what's parallel to in your power, the power of God, we find, and in your salvation. So God's power is for the purpose of saving. And again, one of the chief ways we need to understand salvation is victory. Bring victory for God's people in producing, realizing, bringing about the outcome of God's will. That's what salvation is. That's what true victory is about. God's will being maintained and achieved. And when it is, notice what it says in the second part of the verse, in your salvation, how he will rejoice exceedingly. Now, some of the Jewish sages of old put great emphasis in this word exceedingly. It can also be translated in many places very, like Tov Me'od in Genesis 1, when God looked at his creation and saw his order being, being manifested, he says, behold, everything is good. Tov Me'od, very good. But this word Me'od also is unique, that it can relate to a kingdom adjective. So many times when this word exceedingly or very appears, it's a hint towards a kingdom experience. And that's what we see here. God's power, his salvation, brings about a joy, a kingdom joy for his people. Next verse. Ta'avat libo. Now, this word, ta'ava, speaks of a intense desire, a want. And here we see that this king, he wants the things of God. So the, the desires of his heart, you will give it to him. And we're going to see that this king, he wants what God wants. It is not a scripture that simply says, because he's the king, he gets whatever. Obviously, it all comes within a framework. One of the things that we need to see as useful and for the purpose of safety is the concept of boundaries. When we remain within the boundaries of God's will, there's safety. We're going to experience his strength. We're going to know his victory, his salvation. So we do not want to use freedom, liberty to violate the boundaries of God, but enter into the boundaries of God. So the desires of his heart, you will give it to him. And then we see the request. It's another word. It's rare in the scripture. But it speaks about requests or desires. It's a synonym of his lips. So he expresses what we learned here in this parallelism is what his heart desires. He names it. He speaks it. And most scholars see this as a reference to, to prayer. So he takes the thoughts that he has from an established heart, a heart that desires the will of God. And he, he prays these things before God, so the request of his lips, you will not refrain or prohibit. And then we have the word selah, a word most scholars see of, of emphasis, to put an accent, accent on what is just said. Next verse, verse 4 in Hebrew, verse 3 in English. For you, and this is a word to, to cause one to move forward, to progress. And that's what God does. God moves us 
forward. He grows us, matures us, so that we can go further and further in his will. And the implication of that is this. As we move further into God's will, we are also, here's great news, we are going to be drawing closer and closer to his presence. There is that relationship connection. This is foundational. See, the reason why one is motivated to obey the will of God is because in doing so, one experienced the presence of God. And that's really our desire. That's that request of the king's heart and what he prays before him. For you will, will move him forward in what? Birchot tov. Birchot are blessings. And then we don't have good blessings as some Bibles translate it, but it's blessings of good goodness so it's just not good blessings but the blessings of goodness and again this word good tov has to do with the will of god so it's an idiom for us understanding the blessings of the will of god that's where he's going to move us further and further in in his will and then continuing on you will set his head or upon his head to his head a teret paz a golden crown and we find here and what the scriptures revealing to us and this is simple but so profound and that is this as god moves me i progress in his will i'm going to experience the blessings and how can we understand the blessings? Well, the second part of this verse speaks about the crown of gold. What is that? It is symbolism of rewards. God gives rewards as we move in his will. And notice that the word blessing is in the plural. So there's more and more rewards as we move deeper and deeper and more forward in the midst of God's will. This is the motivation of the man of God, the woman of God, the rewards from God. Verse 5 in Hebrew, 4 in English. The first word of this text is the word chaim, life. And, and what we see here is that this portrays it depicts what life is about true life is not going in your will that is deception true life is when we find ourselves in the midst of god's will doing his purposes and manifesting his glory through an obedience that produces victory that is what the man of God, the woman of God, is called to do what they are, are about, what their life purpose is. So life, he asks from you, and you give it to him. And this life, notice, it's not just any life, just not a human life, but notice it says, Orach yamim olam ve'et. Orach yamin means an extending of days. It speaks about going forward, and the implication is it's on and on. That's why it says, as we look at this last part, where it says, olam ve'ed, which is the term forever. So most interpreters here see the life is a kingdom life. Speaking of life eternal. That is the desires. That's what God's not going to withhold from us. So he does this in the life of his people. Next verse, verse 6 in Hebrew, 5 in English. Gadol kivodo beyeshua techa. Which means great is his glory in your salvation. Now it's speaking about the glory of the king. But the foundation, 
the cause, the source of this glory, and this is the word for honor or significance. The king is going to have a significant rule. His administration is going to be full of that which is heavy, of substance. That's what the word glory, the word glory in Hebrew is the word kavod. It comes from the same root as the word kaved, heavy. And it speaks about something of, of great essence or worth or value, of significance. And we see here, great is his glory, but the source of it is in your, and that's, O oh God, your salvation, O oh God. So we see in this passage what I spoke of at the beginning, this inherent relationship between salvation and the manifestation of the glory of God. Once more, great is his glory in your salvation. And to speak about this glory, we see two other words, splendor and, and majesty. Now, however we translate those two words, hod ve hadar, it's speaking of something that is full of splendor, of glory, of majesty, something that is beautiful. And in the Bible, the concept of beautiful relates to the will and the purposes of God. And he says, the splendor and, and majesty you will set upon him. And this word for set can, can also be to make something equal to, meaning this. Some have understood it as God lifting up, changing the very essence of this man, the king. And this is a process that we all go through. When we are, are obedient and we act in a way that brings about the salvation, the victory, the fulfillment of the purposes of God, that action, those deeds have great significance. And they are going to manifest and place, this is part of the reward, that God is going to work and bring change in the very essence of what we are. He is going to transform, and this is what Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 12, that, that by the mercy of God that he would work with human beings, that we see that there's a transformation, be ye transformed. This is what David is also writing about. Now, verse, verse 7 in Hebrew, 6 in English. For you have set him, and we go back to that same term, birchot, blessings. But notice what it says here. There's another word, not the word birchot tov, blessings of goodness, but here it is, brachot, brachot, la'ad. These are eternal blessings forever. And this is so significant. Because once more, this is an adjective, this word forever, that, that usually is used in regard to the kingdom. So we see twice when this expression, brachot, when it's used here, we see that first it relates to the will of God and then the, the kingdom of God. This concept of forever. And when we... Are, are, are having access to the provision of God. The thing that we need to remember is there's no limitations. They, they don't run out. They don't wear out. There's nothing that, that in any way lessens these. They have an abundance that has no end. And this is why we can serve God with confidence. In the midst of his will, his provision will never be insufficient, inadequate. So he talks about, let's look at this verse carefully. He says, for you have set upon him, brachot le'ad, these blessings that relate to the kingdom, eternal blessings. And then you will make him, and literally it's the word, you will make him sharp. 
And this concept of sharp means, we might say, on the point. It is an idiom that speaks to something that truly checks the box, meets the objective. And in doing so, this change that, that he goes through where he achieves the right things, it is going to produce, notice, in gladness of your face. He is going to be transformed. He's going to be sharpened. And think for a moment of a pencil. A pencil, it can write, but it may write dull. But when you sharpen that pencil, bring it to a fine point, it's able to write in a very, very perfect manner, clear. And what it's saying here is that as we carry out the will of God, serving him for his purposes, we are going to be sharpened, we are going to be transformed, we are going to be made, whereby we are going to, in a better way, accomplish God's will. And the outcome of that, notice what it says, that you will sharpen him with gladness of your face. That is an expression of your presence. So as he approaches God, getting closer and closer to the face of God, the presence of God, that's going to bring in this change, this sharpening of him. So he is more useful and able to, in a more profound, with clarity, do and carry out the will of God. Now look at next verse, verse 8 in Hebrew 7 in English. Why are these things happening to the king? Not just because God, who is sovereign, has chosen him and, and has just made this the will that God wants. No. We see that, that it's because, next verse, Ki ha melech botech be'adonai. Because it is for this reason that the king trusts in the Lord. Now, one of the things that I, I frequently share when, when, when teaching some of the nuances of the Hebrew language from biblical Hebrew is I tell people, always pay attention to what we would call the present tense in biblical Hebrew or the present participle. If you take our Hebrew course at Kingdom Hope College, you will realize that uh, most new, most believers from a Christian standpoint call this grammatical construction a present participle. Most from a rabbinical, a Jewish background will simply call, call, call it the present tense. But the term is not the important thing, what it's called. It's recognizing it and, and almost without exception. When this grammatical construction appears in the Bible, it should capture our attention. It is for the purpose of emphasizing. So the king, and if it's a participle, what's important is this. A participle is a verbal adjective and a, a, a verb that is used to describe. And what's happening here is the king is being described as one who trusts in the Lord. So all of this is happening because the king trusts in the Lord and in the grace. Now, this is bachesed el yom, in this uh, exalted grace or in the grace of the exalted one. So the grace of God. So we see going all the way back to the book of Psalms, to the life and the time of David, the author of this psalm, that we see how significant the term grace is. And grace being the foundation for producing salvation, manifesting victory. For the king trusts in the Lord. And in grace, this grace of the Most High, or in this exalted grace, he will not, will not stumble or fall or collapse or 
I believe many simply translate this phrase, will not be moved. Now here's the biblical takeaway. If you are trusting in God's grace, that grace is always, always connected to the will of God. When you experience the grace of God that saves, it is going to move you towards the will of God. And the good news is when you are in the will of God, committed to the will of God, utilizing the grace of God, you will not be moved out of it. In other words, there is security with the grace of God. The grace of God will produce security and stability in our life. And therefore, we do not have to be concerned with the power of the enemy because the one in us through, by means of the grace of God, is greater. So, so he will not be moved. Verse 9, 8 in English. Your hand, and this is the hand of God, will find all your enemies. Now, I've said a few times, it is very important that our enemies are the enemies of God. If so, this verse, we can find great comfort in it. So if my enemies are your enemies, O oh God, what do we know? We know that the hand of God will find your enemies and your right hand will find the ones who hate you. And what's going to be the outcome of that? Well, the next verse says, you will put them in a, a fiery furnace at the time of your anger. Now, this phrase, le'et panecha, remember the word panecha, your face literally? Now, most scholars see it referring to God's anger in this context, this usage. But what it speaks of, if we, if we interpret it literally, what's there? Face is presence. So when God's presence comes into the world, this is a kingdom experience. This is when, ultimately, this judgment, that great fiery furnace, is going to fall upon this, this earth. And again, not wanting to go on a, a great tangent, but we have that blessed hope, that promise that God will remove us. And let me simply say, when you do a good job of studying the word arpazo, the word that speaks about us being gathered up, it is a word of removal. So important that you see this, being taken away. It is not preserving in the midst of, but a removal. So we have that wonderful promise that when that fiery furnace consumes the, the ones who are residents of this world, who are committed to the, the empire of the Antichrist, we will no longer be here. So you will set them as a fiery furnace at the time of your presence, at the time of your angle. O Lord, in his anger, he will consume them. And this word means literally to swallow them up. And then it says, fire, you will, with fire, you will consume them. Verse 11 in Hebrew, 10 in English. Now it speaks about how this judgment of God's fire that will consume and swallow them up, devour them. It has an ongoing. Notice, and this is very poetic when it speaks about the next generation. For believers, that term, the next generation, anything that, that, that hints to that usually speaks about something good. But for the enemies, the next generation speaks of something that is not good. What do we read here? Verse 11 in Hebrew, 10 in English. Their sons, that is their offspring, from the earth, will perish. And your seed, that is another word for offspring, your children, 
They're going to perish from what? From the sons of man, from humanity. They will no longer be part of God's creation. They are going to be separated in eternal judgment. Why? What was it about them? Well, he tells us in the next verse. Ki natu alecha ra. Which means, for they intended against you evil. Meaning this. And the simplest, the, the most literal way to understand that is this. They contended against God for that which is not his will. And, and that which is not his will is usually what we consider our destiny. The dreams, so often, this so-called destiny and the dreams that I have, they are not, they are not, they are not from God. But they are from the desires of that old man, that flesh. They are about pleasing the flesh rather than pleasing God. See, it is not spirituality to ask God, God bless my plants. That is the foundation of idolatry. True spirituality, that which is pleasing, that which is of God, is when we ask God, God, empower me, lead me, enlighten me in order that I might do your will. That's the difference. So these individuals, for they intended against you evil. They thought a plot, a scheme. And this word is always a plot or scheme that is wrong, incorrect, that does not reflect the character or the purpose of God. And they, notice what it says, they are unable. Now, here's what the scripture's revealing to us. See, one of the worst feelings that a person can have is that of frustration. And frustration oftentimes has a spiritual, spiritual foundation, meaning the source of that frustration is God. He puts that frustration within you because you're wanting to accomplish something that God will not allow, that you are not able to do, that you are trying to, to go past the boundaries of God. God says, no. And because you can't achieve that, you become frustrated. This is all a, a blessing to cause you and to call you to repent. So it says, they devise, they think of this scheme, this plot, but they are not able. For you have put them the back. That's literally what it says, or literally shem, more of the, the shoulder. And what it's saying here is this. God is going to move against them because they have an evil plan, their scheme. And when God moves against them, they are going to flee. So that's what it means here when we see this expression, for, for you have set them, they're back, meaning they're fleeing, they're showing God they're, they're back. And in, and this is a word, it can be used, for like a harp for the strings or the violin, the strings. But it means chords. Some will say it can even refer to rope, strong and, and, and hard rope that, that are not easily broken. And it's speaking about the, the rope, the cord, the string for like a bow. You, you put that, that, that string, attach it to the bow, you put an arrow in and you pull back and that, that string, the, the harder it is and the further you can pull it back, the more power it will have. And that's what it's saying here. We read, and in your strings, these, these cords, you aim at their face. So here, God is aiming his bow with these mighty strings, and he's aiming it at them, they flee, they turn their back before God because of that. But he is going to aim it right at their face, which means he's going to destroy 
their existence. Our, our last verse, verse 14 in Hebrew, 13 in English. Ruma Adonai Be'uzecha. Now, this psalm began with a reference to your strength, your power, O God. And here we have the word Ruma, which is be exalted. God is exalted in his power. It says, be exalted, O Lord, in your power. And this is a manifestation of the context based upon these last verses. Is God bringing salvation for his king? And ultimately that king is Messiah. But bringing salvation victory for that king. And how is he going to do that? What's going to bring about salvation? God's judgment. When God goes to battle, goes to war against those who belong to this world. Those who are committed to what is Ra, that is, that which is not God's will. What is it? Their will. So because of this judgment that God is going to place upon them, victory, salvation is going to be the outcome. And because of that, notice what it says. Nashira un zamra givuratecha. And we will sing and we will praise. So it's a word of song. Both words literally are a word of song. We will sing, and it's a synonym for singing as well. But we'll translate it praise because it's usually praiseful singing. We will sing and we will praise in your power, in your might. Now, we have the word here, oz, and the word for bura, two synonyms for the power, the might of God. And realize it's God's might, his power, that is going to be, be expressed through his judgment, and it's only God's judgment that will produce ultimately the second aspect of salvation. I'm going to close with this, and we talk about this frequently. In Hebrew, there's two words for redemption. The work of redemption, the payment, that's the cross. And the outcome of that work, that payment, and that is the kingdom of God. And what we see here is only through God's judgment Will the kingdom of God, that outcome, that salvation, be, be realized in the fullness of God's intent? And that's why when we look at the book of Revelation and we see God's judgment being poured out and we see the inhabitants of the earth, those who have that evil plot, that evil scheme, them weeping them mourning, them crying out, them looking at the devastation, the loss, the death all around them. When all of this weeping and mourning is going on on the earth, read, for example, Revelation 18. What's going on in heaven? <laughs> they're celebrating. They're praising. They're, they're worshiping God and they're thanking him for his wrath, his judgment. And that's why I'm so opposed to individuals that, that supposedly teach this book, but they always ignore, ignore anything having to do with the judgment of God. Those who ignore the judgment of God will not and do not understand the purpose and the power and the outcome of the cross. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.